学好。那一个，我的名字是庄美伦，啊、uh, ，我是那一个圣约翰大学的教授。So good morning, everyone. My name is David Hedlund. I am an associate professor at Saint John's University in New York City.、Uh, I spent five years living in Taipei, so I do speak a little bit of Chinese, but I'm going to confine my remarks this morning to English. So. I have a very enviable task this morning to introduce a lot of you to some of the new ideas that we've been talking about in terms of business opportunities, entrepreneurship in esports. But to give a little bit more context to my presentation, I thought it would be good to describe this in the context of traditional sports and esports. Now, some of you who were here yesterday, you may have heard some of the speakers discussing the importance of not just building goods and services for esports, but also to build these goods and services for markets beyond just esports, traditional sports and esports. It would almost be like if I built a good or a service just for the Chinese market. What would people who are unable to read the Hanse, the Chinese characters, how would they use this technology if they are unable to read it? So, what a good jumping-off point is to start off with a bit of a comparison between traditional sports and esports. But let me give you a little bit of background into myself. So, for many years, I called myself a retired entrepreneur. That when I was younger. Before I got married and had a family, I spent many years as an entrepreneur, doing different kinds of business activities in countries around the world. But as my career progressed and I decided to settle down, I became an associate professor at St. John's University. So today I have a very wonderful opportunity at St. John's to help our students, many of whom are interested in building businesses and being entrepreneurs. I have the opportunity to help them learn some of the basics, and to help give them some experiences about how do we build companies from the ground up, from understanding the marketplace, understanding there is a need for a good or a service, and then how do we build this? How do we bring this to the marketplace? How do we make it successful? So today, in many educational environments, there are these opportunities. But I didn't start in esports. In fact, like our distinguished, as I call him, the Godfather, Kurt Melcher, I started off in traditional sports. So you may not be able to tell it now, but at one point in my life, I was a professional soccer player, and I had designs on getting paid and doing it for my entire life. Unfortunately, injuries and some other、uh, negative situations did not facilitate that. But that was my start in sports. So I was a player, and then I moved to a coach, coaching college, coaching professional, coaching national team soccer. So I come from originally the sports world. At the same time, though, esports and video games have always been a part of my life. One of the things that many people Who maybe have never played organized sports may realize many individuals who are athletes they love video games. What do we do in the hotel the night before a big match? Do we drink beer? No. Well, maybe, probably not. What kinds of activities might we engage in today? Many athletes they travel with their consoles, their mobile devices, and they are engaged in some of these video games, esports activities. And so, video games and esports have always kind of been side by side in my life, in、uh, as I've progressed throughout my career. Today, though, as a professor, I'm charged with a couple of things: teaching, research, and service. So the first thing that I'd like to show to you today is a little bit about some research. But in order to put it into proper context, 
Since I arrived here in China a few days ago, uh, I've been reading the China Daily newspaper. And just in the last two days, there have been four articles that have been written and published in the, day, in the China Daily. So the first one, mobile farming game helps curb poverty. So this is a farming type of game and there is advertising revenue and the company donates some of their revenue back to impoverished communities uh, around China. The second one, virtual reality helps training of Shanghai fire investigators. So today, rather than putting firemen in dangerous situations, they can use virtual reality to train them about how to deal with different kinds of situations. Anyone from Shanghai? Oh, okay, no Shanghai. So Shanghai, I guess they have a new garbage system and recycling and there's all sorts of different classifications. There are now apps that assist individuals with classifying where it, what type of garbage do you have, where does it go in your Shanghai recycling. And then the final one, tailor-made menswear gets a makeover. So this is an app that allows people to take measurements of your body and then within a few weeks to customize some of this fashion. So these are all examples of some of the technology, some of the entrepreneurial business opportunities just that's been reported in the last few days. So to move forward with my presentation a little bit, let me talk just briefly about some research. So as a professor, I like to try to understand for myself a lot of the research, a lot of the information about who people are, consumer behavior, marketplace research, opinion research, things of this sort. So in this case, how do the behaviors of traditional sports and esports fans compare? So using a grant that I was able to procure, we were able to identify about 1,500 people worldwide. Now, they have all had a common language of English, about 80% of the population was Western countries. And we surveyed them about some of their current behaviors and some of their future intentions behaviors. So what is the likelihood they're gonna do certain things in the future? So we asked them the same questions, first, about traditional sports, and second, about esports. So for example, how many years have you played traditional sports versus esports? You can see, on average for this sample population, people have played traditional sports longer. This is probably not a shocking result for most of you. Traditional sports have been around a lot longer than esports. How many hours a day do you play? Now this was surprising to us, because there's only 24 hours in a day. Yet today, this population that we surveyed, they're playing esports and traditional sports on almost equal levels. And that's quite interesting to us, that more and more people at all ages, this sample is 18 years old to uh, 73 years old, that more and more people, they're spending, they're allocating more of their time to playing esports, which is a very interesting opportunity. So, Perhaps a lot of these consumers, they're interested in new games. So when a new game like Auto Chess or Apex Legends, when these new games come out, we see that a lot of people, they want to learn these new games. They want to see if they like these games, if they're talented or skilled in these games. In addition, looking at how much they're watching esports. So here, people traditionally are still watching traditional sports more than esports. But what we've seen, we've done this research several times, what we're starting to see is people are watching esports more and more. Whether it's that they want to try to understand why people, uh, what type of skills you need to be successful, but people are watching esports more and more. So we may see it start to see this start to tilt even more in esports direction. Now here's where this gets interesting because we spend a lot of time talking about future that in the future there is going to be tremendous growth. Some of the speakers that we've heard over the last day, the two sessions yesterday, they talked about the growth that we're gonna see in the next two, three, four, five years in esports. In some cases, a 30 plus percentage increase year over year. 
in revenues in mobile esports, for example. That's what happened between 2018 and 2019. So trying to understand how likely are people to do some behaviors that publishers, that companies, that businesses want. So how likely are you to play traditional sports and esports? Now, these are on a zero to six scale. So six is a 100% likelihood. I am absolutely gonna do this. While a zero would be there is no chance I will do this. And so what a lot of these statistics show us is to this day, traditional sports still has an edge in a lot of the behaviors that business people, that companies, that entrepreneurs are interested in. So you, they are more likely to spend money on traditional sports than esports. But what these statistics should also show us, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to find, create, make businesses entrepreneurial opportunities, that all of that growth is gonna be developed somewhere, and we all have the chance to be a part of it. So, I'm gonna move through this, since we got started a little bit late, I'm just gonna move through this really uh, a little bit quickly, but we'll just do this briefly. But what I want you to pay attention to is, there are five sections that I've identified as growth in uh, sports, I use those same five dimensions when we talk about esports. So, I've learned from giving presentations uh, all across the world. People like to take photos, so I've tried to put everything all together on one slide, uh, if you'd like to take photos of some of these. So, first, there are opportunities for sport personnel. So, trainers, fitness professionals. In addition today, investments. So more and more sports teams, organizations, and athletes, they're interested in investing. When we look at the United States, for example, in particular, many of the angel investors are coming out of professional sports. They're looking for places to invest their money. So sport organizations, I would say today probably the fitness industry is one of the areas where there is the largest opportunity for entrepreneurial businesses because more and more people, they want to live healthy, active lifestyles. Sports medicine and health. As long as there are gonna be sports, esports, there are gonna be injuries. We're gonna need people to help us overcome some of these injuries. Something that we see quite a bit, even here at this conference here in Xi'an, the opportunity for people to come to a destination, sport tourism. The way that many cities, countries, are now are looking into, should we host the Olympics or the World Cup or some type of mega event? So in 2022, Beijing will host the Winter Olympics. This, the hope, of course, is this will also bring in a lot of money, investment, and tourism. And then, of course, technology. Now, today in the United States, because the United States, I think, is a little bit behind in this industry, Probably the gambling and betting side is one of the biggest areas where exploration is being done in terms of looking for entrepreneurial opportunities. That every day we are seeing new teams and leagues creating relationships with betting and gambling companies. So if you can kind of remember these five and then think about, well, what about esports? Where are some of the opportunities that myself and others see in terms of business opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities in esports. So, number one, training. Athletes want to get better. They want to play better. Whether this is done through coaching or whether this is done through the last point, which is technology, there is a great opportunity today for people who have experience to train others. How do we play games better? What are the strategies? What are the tactics that can be used? On the esports organizational level, so certainly we have similar to sports opportunities in fitness, but I would say in professional esports leagues, this is one of the biggest challenges that many esports games face. Who is the governing body? What are the rules? Are we playing best of two, best of three, best of five, best of seven? 
Are there sportsmanship rules? Who governs these type of opportunities? Are we going to have a league together? Are we going to both compete and cooperate in order to be successful? The health and wellness issue is a very important issue in esports. So I think some of this, we, my colleagues and I have done a fair amount of research on the health and wellness of esports players. One of the most interesting findings, when you look at the professional esports players and professional athletes, in many respects, they are virtually identical. The one area where they differ is how much sleep they get. But in terms of how well they take care of themselves, their nutrition, their health and wellness, are they doing yoga, focused breathing, traditional exercise? Are they eating right? That, the, that there is an opportunity for businesses in these areas. Just like traditional sports, there is opportunity for esports tourism. So, for example, uh, Alan from Air Asia, I don't see him here this morning, but he gave one of the speeches yesterday. And so it, he showed photos from esports events all over Asia. And so there are now opportunities, if there are facilities, if there is financial backing available, then the opportunity then to bring esports events and activities to your cities. And I think the final thing is technology. Whether it's on communication platforms, for streamers, for broadcasters, whether it's for connecting players together, there are great opportunities in this area. But the area where I think there is some of the biggest opportunity is in virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. We have a speaker who's gonna to speak to us uh, in just a few minutes about this topic, so I'm gonna to try not to uh, steal his thunder. But today the opportunities for people to build games, to develop games that are gonna run on some sort of AR, VR, or MR platform, I think this is going to be the future of many esports games. So with that, I thank you very much for your time this morning, and I wish all of you a wonderful conference here in Xi'an. Thank you.